All right, our sermon text for this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. We're almost finished with Hebrews. We've been studying this book since April. Lord willing, we'll wrap up next week. And this fall, by the way, we're going to have a series in the book of Joshua from the Old Testament. But today, Hebrews chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 19. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn there. If you don't, though, it's printed out in your bulletin, and it should be on the screen, one of the screens, or both of the screens behind me. Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll begin reading in verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for He has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke, the word, who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. Do not neglect to do good and to share with what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. This is God's Word. In this chapter, chapter 13, or at least in our verses that we're studying this this morning, I count at least 15 different commands for God's people. And these commands don't come out of nowhere. There is a context for them. Chapter 12, uh, specifically, talks about this good news of Jesus Christ. It's really all of Hebrews, but boy, it's a, it culminates in chapter 12, which Schuyler preached on last week. And the author here is saying that the people who read this letter and believe this gospel, this good news about Jesus Christ, they should live differently. As a result, and you see this pattern in all the New Testament letters, just about all the ones, especially the ones that Paul wrote, where he starts off the letter by explaining what God has done in Jesus Christ. That's the first half or first two-thirds of the letter. And then he spends the last part of the letter explaining, all right, this is how you live in light of what I've just taught you. This is what you do in light of what God has done in Jesus Christ. you got examples in Galatians and Ephesians and Philippians. Well, that's what's happening here in Hebrews. He's he's spent 12 chapters in Hebrews explaining what God has done, and then 13 is chock full of these commands. This is how you live in light of what God has done. And uh, the editors of the Bible, out of which we preach on Sunday mornings, the English Standard Version, and now the editors are human beings that live right now. These these editors aren't inspired, and the headings they produce... Between chapters are not inspired either, but I think they did a good job with their heading for chapter 13. Their heading was, Sacrifices Pleasing to God. And I think that's how we should think about what we're going to consider here today. We have a chance, as God's people, in light of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ to offer Him sacrifices that are pleasing to Him. Now, sacrifices aren't easy. 
We, don't, we wouldn't call them sacrifices otherwise, but they do please Him. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Three points to my sermon. Uh, if you haven't been here for chapters 1 through 12, or you're, 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 not, you're not a Christian, you're, you're visiting here for the first time, or one of your first times trying to learn what it means to be a Christian, I'm going to explain what the gospel is at the end of the sermon. But since the author starts off with these commands, I figured I'd start my sermon off with it, but then come back and explain this good news one more time before we take the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. But the three points of the sermon are, we have this new life that we're supposed to live. First, let's look at the nature of the new life. Second, let's look at the model for this new life. And then third, the power for it. The nature of this new life, the model for this new life, and the power for this new life. First, the nature. Now, there's 15 commands. I'm not going to cover all 15. It would take too long, or I'd just really, just barely touch all of them. So we're going to talk not about all of them, but several of them, including the first one, which is found in first verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. And the old New International Version of the Bible that I kind of grew up, I cut my teeth reading years and years ago, translates it as, keep on loving each other as brothers. Boy, I think that's a good translation. Keep on loving each other as brothers. And there's a Greek word translated here that you're all familiar with, probably, especially if you're fans of the Phillies, or if Jalen Hurts is your fantasy quarterback. And that Greek word is Philadelphia. You know, we think of it as a city of brotherly love, but literally in Greek, Philadelphia means brotherly love. Now, when we hear the word brotherly love, we don't apply it strictly just to our immediate family. You know, it's, when we hear brotherly love, we don't think it's only between two males physically born of the same man and woman. We have a broader range of the term brothers these days. I mean, if you're in a, or sisters, because in Greek, they would have understand that as applying to women as well. I mean, if you're in a fraternity or a sorority at Ole Miss, you're calling everybody brother or sister, or at least in principle, that's what you are. You might call people, you, you know, good friends, my brother, my sister. You might, uh, you know, college football. We're the such and such family, right? We're the Ole Miss family. We're the Mississippi State family. I mean, we use these familial terms all the time. But I, what you need to know is that no one used brotherly love that way before Christianity. Christianity unlocked that term because prior to Jesus Christ, no one used Philadelphia to mean anything other than the mutual affections between blood relatives. You never talked about brotherly love with somebody outside of your family. But inside Christianity, what makes you family, what is primary, is that you love Jesus. And you believe He loves you. So inside Christianity, in order to get this brotherly love from other people, it doesn't matter if you're not of the same physical family, if you have the same common descent from an ancestor. It does not matter how much money you have. It does not matter what you do for a living. It does not matter what you look like or how popular, you, how popular you are or where you grew up or where you went to high school. It doesn't matter if you're white or black or any other race. As Jesus put it, if you are loving and trusting in Jesus Christ, as he put it in Matthew 23, 8, you are all brothers. And you just got to realize, I mean, you, you say, well, this isn't big news. Well, it's not big news now because Christianity has been pounding this into your head for 2,000 years. But it was big news 2,000 years ago. This was a novel idea. In fact, most critics of Christianity thought it was crazy. We actually have the documents, the letters they wrote. One critic of Christianity writing in the second century, a guy named Lucian of Samosata, he made fun of Christians for this brotherly love. Oh, you're going to love people that you're not related to by blood as brothers. That's stupid. And this is what he wrote. Their original lawgiver, Christians' original lawgiver, meaning Jesus, persuaded them that they should be like brothers to one another. Therefore, they despise all things equally. In other words, these Christian people... They hold on to their money very loosely, and they're quick to give it to one another if they think they need it. 
They view all things between them as common property. Now, you you can't really hear it. If you got to read more of what Lucian wrote to hear the tone, but he's being, he's mocking Christians. This is crazy. Who gives their money away to anybody, let alone people you don't have to because they're blood relations? But in Christianity, that's what you do. If you see a brother in need, someone who makes the same confession you do about Jesus Christ, you help them. In the discussion. And included in this brotherly love is something in verse 3. Remember those who are in prison, as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Now in ancient times, when you were put in prison, you faced a real danger of starvation. Because prison wardens 2,000 years ago did not see it as their obligation to keep you fed. So you can see why this could be a problem, right? You're locked up in a cell. How are you going to get food? The people locking you up aren't going to give it to you. You're going to starve unless someone loves you enough from the outside to bring it in, to care for you. And as Christians were getting locked up all over the Roman world, being persecuted for their beliefs, Paul and the other apostles are sending these letters out. Do not forget your brothers in prison. Not not the same situation going on when Christians visit prisons today, though that is right and good. This was a matter of life and death, starvation. Food and water so that they could live. But Christians are not only called to love other Christians. Because second, we are to also love strangers. That's verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now that entertaining angels unawares is a reference to Genesis chapter 18. Way back in the Old Testament, where the patriarch Abraham, the father of the people of God, meets three men. And he welcomes them into his tent, and he feeds them, and it turns out that they're angels And one of those three angels, Abraham addresses as Yahweh, or the covenant name of God, the personal covenant name of God. Very interesting passage. We don't have time to go into exploring all that. But the point of chapter 13, verse 2 in Hebrews is not so much that if someone knocks on your door, you need to figure out if he's an angel or not, though he could be. The point is is that Greek word again, which is translated as hospitality. I want to go into it like I did with Philadelphia. Philadelphia is love of brothers. Phileo adelphoi, love of brothers. The word translated as hospitality here in verse 2 is philoxenia. Also two Greek words, but this time it's phileo love of xenos, strangers. You know the word xenophobia? Fear of people from different cultures from you. Fear of foreign people. We get that word xenophobia from philoxenia. The xenia in that word. Christians are never to be xenophobes. Rather, we are called to practice philoxenia. Love of strangers. So, Christians don't just love other Christians. We don't just you know, maintain in holy huddles and just love the people in our church and the rest of the world can go to hell in a handbasket. Rather, our, our primary focus is loving one another as brothers inside the family of Jesus Christ. That is where we put the lion's share of our time and our resources and our energy. But we will, as Christians, never meet anyone who is unworthy of our love. No matter what nation they come from, no matter their politics, no matter their view of or practice of sexual ethics, no matter how much we might think they're wrong and it's people like them that are destroying our country, nevertheless, we love them. I mean, Jesus Christ said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Christians are the love people. End of period, end of paragraph, end of book. We love all people. Philoxenia, love of strangers, is a mark of this new life we have in Jesus. Third, it is also a life free from the love of money. 
That's verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now just be honest for a second with yourself. How much time do you spend wishing you had the possessions somebody else had? How much time do you spend envying other people's clothes, other people's cars, other people's neatly manicured lawn, and everything in the flower bed, no weeds in it whatsoever. You can see where my mind goes, right? Other people's vacations, other people's hunting trips. How much of your energy is spent worrying about money? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to put the kids through college? You're called to leave all those worries behind in Christianity. Because in Christianity, you have a father who has promised to provide for every need. Our, our, our lives are free from the love of money. Free from the fear. To be free from the fear of not having enough money. And then fourth, in this new life, we are to honor marriage. Verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor by all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Now this might be the place where you expect the preacher to go off on how sex crazed our culture is and how there are all these you know, uh, just confusion out there about sexual identities and how all sex outside of a marriage between a man and a woman is wrong. And that's all true, by the way. That's all true. But managing to stay a virgin until you're married and then only having sex with your spouse until you, one or the other of you dies is not the sum total of honoring marriage. There's a lot more to it than that. There's a great article called Living by Vows. You can Google it after church. It's readily available. Written by a man named Robertson McQuilkin. Dr. McQuilkin was the president of Columbia International University over in South Carolina. And in the late 80s, early 90s, his wife, a wonderful woman named Muriel, developed early onset Alzheimer's. She was just in her 50s, and I'm just a few, away, a few years away from my 50s, so it's, it's sobering to think about this. But Dr. McQuilkin describes his wife's descent into early onset Alzheimer's like this. Muriel never knew what was happening to her, though occasionally when there was a reference to Alzheimer's on TV, she would muse aloud, I wonder if I'll ever have that. It did not seem painful for her, but it was a slow dying for me to watch the vibrant, creative, articulate person I knew and loved gradually dimming out. And her symptoms, you know, advanced quickly. And he's the president of a university. He's got a lot of responsibilities. And so his board is coming together. And friends, you know, do you institutionalize her? Do you not? How do you care for your wife? And ultimately, he decided to resign early, resign in his 50s from the presidency so that he could take care of his wife full time. He continues in this article. Muriel cannot speak sentences now, only phrases and words and often words that make little sense. No, when she means yes, for example. <clears throat> but she can say one sentence, and she says it often. I love you. She not only says it, she acts it. The board arranged for a companion to stay in our home so I could go daily to the office. During those two years, it became increasingly difficult to keep Muriel home. As soon as I left, she would take out after me. With me, she was content. Without me, she was distressed, sometimes terror-stricken. The walk to school is a mile-round trip. She would make that trip as many as ten times a day. Sometimes at night when I helped her undress, I found bloody feet. When I told our family doctor, he choked up. Such love, he said simply. Then after a moment, I have a theory that the characteristics developed across the years come out in times like these. Then McQuilkin says, I wish I loved God like that, desperate to be near him at all times, 
Thus she teaches me day by day. And then for another 13 years after he wrote those words, he cared for his wife until she died of Alzheimer's in 2003 at the age of 81. Now, I, I, don't write, I don't read that article to make anyone question any hard, agonizing decisions you've had to make about loved ones at the end of their lives. I mention it just because it was the best example I could think of this week about what honoring marriage looks like. Now, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, no matter what you think about our faith, I just want you to consider something. Wouldn't our world be a better place if everybody in it decided that they were going to love everybody and then really focus, though, on a group of people who shared the same confession and poured their resources into them, and then also devoted themselves to their spouse till death do they part, and on top of that, were freed from the love of money? I mean, isn't it at least possible this world could be a better place if everybody lived like that? And I'm here to tell you, that's really all Christianity is at the end of the day. That is our ethic. That is the nature of this new life. Now, this is the scary part of the sermon. For me, not for you. For me, as you'll see. Point two, the model for this new life. Let's read verse 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. In other words, the pastors in your church. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Do you know how many times I wish this verse wasn't in the Bible? No sane Christian wants to hold themselves out as a model for anything to be imitated because all sane Christians are deeply aware of how really flawed they are and how often they let people down. There are some pastors who are idiots, and they kind of walk around like this. I'm a pastor. I'll tell you how to raise your kids. I'll show you how to get your wife to submit to you, because I'm a pastor. If you find a clown like that, just run as far away from him as, you, as quickly as you can. But that is one of the non-negotiables of being a pastor is that you're inviting people to judge you. Not in a sinful way. It's just that we're called to be a model. We're, we are someone that you are as God's people to consider, to evaluate their way of life. The author of Hebrews says, the people need a model. This is your job. If I had understood this properly before I became a pastor, I probably wouldn't have become a pastor. You know, it's kind of like marriage. There are certain things you just can't grasp until you're actually in it, right? I mean, those of you who have been married for more than a few years, you can remember that time somebody, some older, wiser couple pulled you aside while you were engaged and said, hey, I'm so glad you found this person. They are wonderful. You're going to make a great couple, but I just want you to know it's going to be hard. There are going to be fights. And you said, yeah, okay, yeah. And then they left, and you went to your fiancé, and you looked at each other with stars in your eyes, and you said, nah, not us. That'll never be us. You're just so in love with the other person that you didn't think it would turn out any other way, right? It's like that with being a pastor. And I'm sure lots of other professions as well. You're just so in love with the idea of it that you just think, nah, that'll never happen to me. It'll be easy. It'll be great. Nevertheless, I and some others in the room, I should add, other pastors and elders in the room, I'm not alone on this, we are called to be a model. Yet I'm also a big-time sinner. I won't speak for the other guys, but they're probably sinners too. So I need you, the people in my church, to do two things. First of all, pray for your pastors. Pray for us by name. CJ, JD, Skyler, Jared, all the elders that are listed there in your bulletin. Verse 18 of chapter 13 says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. We need you interceding with God for us, because I promise you, 
Our consciences are clear in that we at least want to do the right things. We know we let you down. We know we're not perfect, but we at least desire to do the right things. But the one thing, as many flaws as pastors have, the one thing all of us can aspire to is that we can be approachable. My wife and I this summer uh, read the book, How to Stay Married, by a native Mississippian, Harrison Scott Key. He, uh, he now teaches at Savannah College of Art and Design. We've had a few students wind up at SCAD from our church. and In fact, one of his cousins is a member of our church. It's a story of how he was not a great husband and his wife left him twice for the same man. But, I'm sorry, I'm going to spoil it for you. They do get back together in the end. It's still worth reading, even though you know how it turns out. But what, my, what got my attention, because this is what I do for a living, is how he talked about the pastors in his life, because Harrison Scott Key is a Christian. And he said when he and his wife first moved to Savannah 20 years ago, they went to a big historic, very nice, but very austere downtown church. And when his wife left him the first time, Key went to talk to his pastor to get some counsel. And he, he calls his pastor, this first pastor in the book, Reverend Dr. Hairshirt, which is not a compliment, I can assure you. He was an unapproachable man, very gifted, a very gifted preacher, a scholarly man, but austere, you know, almost like minor royalty. He was so unapproachable. And Key writes in his book that uh, in preaching, Hair Shirt's, quote, dominant emotion was amazement, not at go- God's goodness or at the majesty of creation, but at the fact that more people had not come to church. Incredulity was his love language. Even when he had wondrous insights to share of divine love and the gift of eternal life through Jesus, he expressed these miraculous revelations with the grace of an oncologist announcing that the chemo hadn't worked. He smiled little from the pulpit unless discussing Beethoven's Seventh Symphony or, in moments of pure exaltation, the University of Southern California, his alma mater. So... He and his wife reconcile, they leave that church, they go to a different church in town, and then she leaves him the second time. And this time she actually lives with this other man. But finally she decided she wanted to come back home. So they get on the phone, they're talking to one another. She says, I don't know when he's going to come back. You've got to come get me right now. And so he's going to drive over to his wife's house where she's living with another man and he's going to pack her things and bring her home and he knew he needed backup. So, he texted the pastor of his new church. And this is a man who preached from the same Bible as Reverend Dr. Hairshirt. He was even in the same Protestant tradition as Reverend Dr. Hairshirt, but he was approachable. And his pastor's response when he got the text from Harrison Scott Key was three words, on my way. And Key says, uh, he finishes this account by writing, find a church where your pastor will text back, on my way. Now, if you're ever in a real crisis like that, I hope you know you can text us. And it's not like we have some magic solution. It's not like we can fix every marriage and... uh, bring back wayward children. I wish we could. But at least you don't have to be alone, and at least somebody can pray with you. And I hope you know that before things ever get that bad, you can come and talk to us. It's probably nothing we haven't heard before. You you probably won't surprise us after 20 years. I don't think there are a whole lot of those left for me. And we're not interested, just so you know, we're not interested in yelling at you or making you feel bad. We know you wouldn't be coming to us with your problems unless you also already felt pretty crummy. But we are here. And if we can't really aspire to being too much of an example for you, we at least want to be approachable. Does that make sense? So first of all, pray for your pastors. But then second also... Obey your pastors. 
That's verse 17, first part of it. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. Now, I've got to explain that, don't I? This verse does not mean you have an obligation to do anything your pastors might say. So, for example, this, is, this verse does not mean that I can call you up on a Saturday morning and say, Hey, you're a member of my church. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders. I want you to come and wash and wax my car. Now, there are some churches that do that, but technically those are cults, not churches. So what does obey your, leader, your leaders mean? It, it simply means this. We have all agreed, if you're a member of this church, we have all agreed to submit ourselves to the Word of God. And so we are coming to you through the teaching of the Word and sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. And we're saying simply, hey, we all signed an agreement that we were going to do what this book says. Are you in or out? That's really the only authority we have. That's the only kind of obedience we are interested in. Now, let's read all of verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Do you know that your pastors are going to have to give an accounting for you on Judgment Day? We're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's going to ask us, tell me about so-and-so. You know, He said He was a member of your church. What makes pastors groan now is when we have members who want nothing to do with the church, who when they come, they are here clearly reluctantly, and they really have no desire to love one another deeply from the heart, let alone strangers, let alone honor marriage. That makes us groan now because we know one day we're not going to be able to give a suitable answer to the Lord Jesus for you. But do you know what makes pastors really happy now? What gives us joy now? When you obey God's word. When we catch you loving other people. You didn't think we saw it, but we heard about it. When we catch you loving strangers, when we see you trying to cherish your wife and build her up and encourage her, and when we see you hug your kids, that brings us joy because we know that on that day of judgment when Jesus says, what about so-and-so, we can say, oh yeah, I know him. Not only did he love you, Jesus, he loved me very well. Now, third and finally, the power for this new life. Here's what you need to know if you're going to be a Christian. And you're really going to try to do what we've talked about this morning. It will cost you. If you insist on treating all Christians, no matter their race, their nationality, their ethnicity, as family... And if you insist on loving strangers and showing them hospitality, some people who call themselves Christians will think you're suspect. They'll see what you're doing. They're saying, they'll say things like, oh, that's that woke stuff. That's that social justice stuff. Stay away from him. But if you also insist on a biblical sex ethic, and if you esteem marriage, and you say, my body is not mine to do with whatever I please. I belong to Jesus, so I'm only going to use sex in its proper context. And I'm not just going to be okay when society disagrees with me. I'm not going to be rude, but I am going to be vocal, and I'm going to point out the lies that our society is telling us about sexual identity and sexual ethics because I want the next generation to be happy and flourish and know what the truth is. If you do that, some people will point, you'll, it'll cost you because some people will point at you and say, well, there goes a bigot. Well, they hate gay people at that church. Stay away from them. You cannot... Live a life as a Christian without getting it from all sides. From all sides. So how can you do it? Well, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's read verses 8 to 14. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, 
For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. So friends, this is what I want you to know. Whether you're a Christian today, whether you're considering becoming a Christian, when you suffer for living this new life, you're not going to be doing anything Jesus didn't do before you. He lived this life perfectly. I mean, no other human being ever perfectly loved everybody like Jesus. But they didn't give him any humanitarian awards for his lifestyle. What did they do? They dragged him outside the city after beating him within an inch of his life, and they crucified him. The cruelest, more, most inhumane form of execution man has still to this day yet devised. But when he died, because he was innocent, we can be sure he did not die for his sins. Whose sins did he die for? All of us who know we don't measure up. All of us who know we blow it. All of us who are sinners, including all of us who don't love one another as brothers like we should. All of us who don't love strangers like we should. All of us who think way too much about money and all of us who have been sexually immoral. If you know that is you, if you know you're a sinner, Jesus Christ died for you. And three days later, he was raised from the dead as evidence that God is not going to hold you guilty for your sins because he held Jesus guilty in your place. Friends, if you'll only admit your sin and your need and that Jesus died for you, welcome to the family. Start experiencing some Philadelphia, not the cheesesteak, the, the love. And then finally, verse 5. Keep your life free, life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. For he has said... I will never leave you nor forsake you. We're going to take the Lord's Supper in a moment. And friends, when you get that bread and that cup in your hands, what I want you to be thinking is, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve far worse than being forsaken by God. But because of Jesus' body and blood, my Father will never leave me. My Father will never forsake me. It's not a matter of my record. It's a matter of Christ's. That's how you live the new life. Now let's pray together and take the Lord's Supper.